I want to talk about the financial crisis and from a U.S. point of view, but I think that's okay because the crisis began in the U.S. Uh, there was, of course, that's sometimes called the global financial crisis, so there were problems in Europe and Australia and probably here. Uh, It's obviously a very uh, complicated topic. There are lots of moving parts. People have written dozens of books on the topic, so I'm going to be giving a, you know, aerial view from a high altitude, uh, high above the surface. But I want to emphasize things that I think have been underemphasized in a lot of the journalistic accounts, certainly. So, among economists. Uh, this is sort of a standard way of looking at what happened to the U.S. economy. Here's the actual track of the economy, and this smooth path above it is what's called potential output. So it's an estimate, it's not a measurement. It's how much output the economy would be performing at producing at so-called full employment. And here's the dot-com recession. And the economy starts to catch up to its, so it, it was actually above the estimated potential output uh, until the crash came. And so people have recognized that this was kind of a bubble, an unsustainable level of output back here above the full employment. So in a sense, the economy was over fully employed. Uh, then there's the recovery. Uh, so the economy gets back to full employment, according to this way of looking at it, and then something happens. Oh, I've got some captions here. So <laughs> what happened? Right? It, nobody saw it coming because, according to this way of looking at it, it doesn't look like the economy is above the sustainable path. It looked like it was just performing at full employment, so that's great. But suddenly it fell off a cliff. And so there's an actual decline. This is. Uh, real output. There's an actual, not just slow growth, but decline in real output, uh, 2009. Uh, finally, the bottom is turned and the economy begins to recover, but it's not catching up to the full employment path. And actually, if you, you look closely, you see that the full employment path has been bent down a little bit <laughs> to take account of the fact that people are dropping out of the labor force. So they're not even looking for jobs in 2011, 2012. So very slowly, the actual path of the economy is catching up to full employment. But this uh, way of looking at it explains why even after, let's see, the recession officially ends in 2009, after seven years of recovery, the central bankers still think the economy needs more stimulus because it's below this supposed uh, path of potential output. Right? So the Federal Reserve System's been very reluctant to start raising interest rates above rock bottom rates, above zero rates. And the uh, unemployment rate has come down. The unemployment rate in the U.S. is now uh, about for between four and four and a half percent, which is considered full employment. But a lot of people have dropped out of the labor force, so the Fed thinks it still needs to be providing stimulus to the economy, although they have finally begun raising their target interest rates. I'm going to suggest a different way of looking at the data. So let's take off the full employment path. This is the same time series for real output. Verify that. Okay, good. Uh, now just put a different path through the output. Just put a trend through the output reflecting the long run trend up to the dot com bubble. So that looks like that. Uh, I did this by hand, but so you have to sort of take my word for it that if you go backwards, it's tracking the actual growth path of the economy. And now you see it differently, right? So just by putting a trend through the middle of the data instead of above the data, it looks a little differently. So we see the same bubble here, the recession, but now the economy's 
on an unsustainably high path as estimated by its sort of long run trend. Right? So I'm going to provide some evidence that this is due to a credit boom. That is, the Federal Reserve is providing too much cheap credit. And that's because they're still fighting the recession of 2001 uh, up to about 2006. They're still keeping interest rates unusually low, feeding credit into the economy. And of course, we have a housing bubble. The housing market takes off, prices go up, and there's a lot of new construction because interest rates are low. Lots of people can afford to finance a second house. Um, there's lots of speculation in housing. But it's not surprising when you get this far above the long run trend that there's going to be a correction. So there's a bust. Right? So instead of thinking of the economy as struggling to get up to full employment, think of it as being overly stimulated. The correction comes because it just can't be sustained, the economy that much above its trend. Uh, a lot of the investments that are made under the influence of low interest rates are not sustainable uh, when interest rates return to normal. And so there's a bust. A lot of housing investment is wiped out in value terms. In uh, 2009, if you flew into Las Vegas, which was one of the big speculative building centers, you could look out the window of your airplane and see half-finished houses and condominiums that had just been abandoned. So they had paved the streets for a subdivision and put in the foundations and then not built anything on top of them. It was quite striking. Uh, and so this post-bust path the economy is on, I want to suggest is the new normal. We're not going to catch up to the old bubble path. Uh, and we're actually not going to catch up to the old long run path because we destroyed a lot of capital. We wasted a lot of capital putting it into houses that people didn't want, weren't willing to pay, weren't able to pay cost covering prices. So I want to tell the story of the credit boom and the bust. Uh, all right, so when a central bank provides credit cheaply, so it pumps credit into the economy, increases the supply of credit at the given interest rate, then to make more loans, banks have to l offer lower interest rates. And they've got the funds to do it with, because the central bank has provided the funds to the market. Uh, so they drive the interest rate down. In, in the case of the dot-com recovery, it wasn't so much, I mean, it's appropriate to lower interest rates in a recession, but as the economy began to recover, they didn't raise them appropriately. So they didn't further lower them after 2001, but they kept them at 1% when they should have been, the Fed should have been raising them. It has the same effect. It stim uh, injects credit into the economy to keep the interest rates low. Uh, that stimulates spending. And as investment recovers, it over amplifies uh, the investment boom. So the recovery involved uh, especially a revival in housing and that was that was okay if it had been kept within bounds but it went too far. Too much money went into housing. Uh, the amount of credit going into mortgages was rising at 10 to 15 percent a year for several years which you know way exceeds the population growth or any reasonable estimate of how many houses could have been sold. So it stimulates projects, uh, stimulated projects, especially in housing, for reasons I'll discuss in a minute, uh, that aren't going to be sustainable when interest rates come back to normal because lots of people found that when their adjustable rate mortgages adjusted upward, they couldn't afford them anymore. Uh, so when interest rates and spending normalize, that causes a crisis because some of the investments were counting on continued cheap credit. They can't be refinanced at the new higher interest rates. So there's got to be some liquidation. Some investments are going to be abandoned. And then there's a period of restructuring. People who've been fired from their construction industry jobs take a while to find new jobs. Uh, 
fortunately in the U.S. we have a fairly flexible labor market, but people are reluctant to move if they were, you know, in a construction project in Nevada, the new job waiting for them may be somewhere else. They may be reluctant to move. And of course, uh, our, we have a generous uh, unemployment insurance system, so people are subsidized to take time to find a new job. And during the recession, the Obama administration extended the number of weeks of unemployment insurance. Uh, one of the features of unemployment insurance that's been st well studied is if you have, uh, say, 50 weeks of unemployment insurance, it runs out after 50 weeks, so you need to find a job within the 50 weeks. When do you think most people find that job? <laughs> weeks 48 and 49. A lot of people, you know, take advantage of the, the subsidy to search, and they keep searching until they see, you know, the, the end coming and then they get serious, or they settle for a job offer they already had but hadn't taken because they were going to continue to search. When it was extended to 100 weeks, <laughs> now people take 98 weeks to find a job, so that inflates the uh, measured unemployment rate and slows down the recovery because workers are not getting reintegrated into the production system uh, as quickly. So that's the recession. So the recession is where the mistakes of the boom are corrected. And resources, investment resources and workers who were in the wrong lines of work, in the wrong businesses, uh, have to find where they should be, where they can be sustainably employed. And in this kind of story, uh, the cycle is going to be most severe in the industries that are most interest rate sensitive, and that's housing. Right? housing the fortunes of housing construction especially rise and fall as the interest rate falls and rises. Because right? at low interest rates, more people can afford houses and there'll be higher demand for housing. It's a very long-term investment, so anybody who's taken a finance course knows that the longer the duration of the investment, the more sensitive the present value is to a change in the interest rate. Right? When you're building a 30-year house, that's a long stream of uh, if you're taking out a 30-year mortgage on a house, right, it makes a big difference uh, when the interest rate falls, what the monthly payment's going to be. An analogy that suggests itself very easily to the, to the boom and the bust is that the boom is like binge drinking, like you were all doing last night, where uh, I'm using the American College campus definition of binge drinking, which is two drinks or more. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a kind of a euphoric feeling, uh, except the next morning, the more euphoric you were, the worse the hangover is. So the, the bust is like the hangover where things have to be fixed. Uh, and, of course, a popular remedy is start drinking again. <laughs> and that's been the Federal Reserve's response, but it doesn't really sort out the problem. Uh, George Bush, who was a veteran drinker, actually got this analogy. He gave a talk uh, to some people in 2009, be just before he left office, and uh, the audience wanted to know what's, uh, this was uh, some Republican Party supporters, the audience wanted to know what happened. Why was there a crash? And he said, okay, everybody turn off your cell phones, because I'm going to tell you what happened. Of course, somebody recorded it. And these are his literal words. He said, Wall Street got drunk, and now it has a hangover. So my argument, I mean, I think that's a pretty good analogy. Even a blind squirrel finds, finds an acorn now and then. Um, I want to suggest that it's the Federal Reserve System. It's the cheap credit that spiked the punch bowl that led Wall Street to get drunk. OK, this is going to be a little technical, but uh, I want to illustrate the point that when the interest rate changes, the kind of investments that investors choose will change. And in particular, they'll go for more capital intensive or longer duration. The old fashioned term was more roundabout uh, investments. Investments that either take longer to complete or that have longer useful lives once they are completed so that a greater portion of their value comes from their future revenues 
right? Because future revenues, their value today is based on the interest rate at which the future revenue is discounted back to the present. A low interest rate means a very small discount rate, so the future revenues are loom much larger in the present value calculation. So something that's not worth, an investment that's not worth doing at a 5% interest rate is very profitable at a 3% interest rate if it's because the revenues are further in the future. So here's what the illustration is. Suppose this is an investment project and how its value rises over time. And since we visited a winery yesterday, parable is somebody's uh, planting grapes. And at first the, the value is negative. A lot's been expended and if you sold the field of uh, grapevines, it's not worth as much as what's put into it, so the value is negative. But over time, as the grapes mature, and then they're harvested, and then they're put into bottles, the value is rising. And when do you sell the wine? You sell the wine when the value of the wine in the bottle stops growing faster than the discount rate. Right? So if the value of the wine in the bottle is rising 5% a year, and the interest rate in the economy is 3%, well, it's growing in present value, right? You sell it when it stops growing any faster than the interest rate. That maximizes the present value, so that's shown by the tangency here. So P star is the maximum present value, and you find the present value by going back here to the, this is the log of the present value, uh, back to the present. So theta is the optimal harvest time. All right, uh, if you don't like the wine analogy, you can think of even simpler. You plant a tree, and the question is, when do you cut it down? And you cut it down when the, if the interest rate in the economy is 3% and the tree is growing at 5% a year, that's a better return on your investment. Keep it growing. But when the tree slows down and starts growing less than 3% a year, you do better off cutting down the tree and putting the money in the bank. At the bank, it'll grow 3%. If you leave it in the tree, it's now growing less than 3%. Right? So that maximizes your present value. So if the discount rate changes, here's a lower interest rate. Uh, so suppose it was 3% here and now it's 1%. You let the tree keep growing until it's no longer growing faster than 1%. Uh, if you think of it all from the present point of view when you're first undertaking the investment, most investments are not like trees where you can cut it down any time and get the, you know, get the lumber out of it. It's just a question of when. Most investments you are committed to a certain production cycle, a certain time to build. Uh, and so houses are like that. Uh, you, you choose at the time of investment whether you're going to you know, make a five-year investment or a seven-year investment. If you choose a seven-year investment because the interest rate is low, it's fine if the interest rate stays low. But if the interest rate rises, then it turns out you made a mistake. You made a poor investment, a mal-investment, uh, some people say. Right, so at lower interest rates, it pays to make longer horizon investments. But if interest rates go back up, that turns out to be a mistake. So it can also be described as capital deepening or more roundabout investment. All right, so it looked rational at the time if you thought low interest rates were going to continue to invest a lot in housing. After the fact, it was a mistake. Uh, so here's a simple, well, simple to me. <laughs> uh, Emily already induced. Uh, introduce supply and demand curves, so you're all familiar with them now. Think about the supply and demand for credit or loanable funds, we sometimes call it. Uh, so on the horizontal axis, it's dollars of lending, and it measures both the, the source of lending, the savings, that's S, and the take up of the funds, the demand for loanable funds, that's investment. So here's an upward sloping supply curve. Uh, at a higher interest rate, there'll be more net savings by households made available through the banking system. And here's the downward sloping demand curve. At a low interest rate, people will want to borrow a lot for investment because they've got lots of projects that 
are profitable to finance at a low interest rate, they'll pay back more enough to repay the loan and have something left over. But as the interest rate goes up, that benchmark rises, and so fewer and fewer investment projects are worth financing. The quantity of credit demanded at higher interest rates is lower. So there's an equilibrium point at which the quantity demanded equals the quantity supplied. And the economy is well coordinated. Now, if the central bank decides to make credit cheaper and shifts the supply of credit to the right by increasing the money supply, so on the central bank injects reserves into the banking system. The banks then are in a position to expand their lending to, in a sense, get rid of the excess reserves they've got. Uh, on the bank balance sheet, there's lending on one side, that's the bank's assets, and deposit accounts on the other side, those are the bank's liabilities. And when banks make loans, they create, when the banking system makes loans, it creates new deposits. Deposits are counted as part of the money supply. So my abbreviation here is there's an increase in the money supply. But equally, it's an increase in the amount of loans made by the banks. So at a lower interest rate now, there's a greater quantity of loans being made. Now, uh, there's a scarcity constraint on the mix of goods the economy can produce. There's only so much an economy can produce. So if more resources are being devoted to investment projects, if more workers are moving out of the retail sector into housing construction, let's say, consumption has to go down so that investment can go up. So here's consumption on the vertical axis and investment on the horizontal axis. And this curve here, sometimes called a production possibilities frontier, just indicates that there's a trade-off between more consumption and more investment. And in a fully employed economy, you can either produce more consumption goods and less investment, or more investment by saving, more saving, and therefore less consuming. But in this case, because the central bank has distorted the uh, credit market, the economy is trying to eat its cake and have it too. There, it's, there's a contradiction between the plans of the savers and the plans of the investors. Right? So it used to be that savings equaled investment. Now the savers aren't any more eager to save. The new credit's not coming from them. It's coming from the central bank. And that's making, at the lower interest rate, making the investors more eager to invest. So investors want to invest more, but households don't want to save anymore to provide the resources for investment. In fact, at a lower interest rate, households want to save less and consume more. So there are two forces tugging on the allocation of resources. Consumers want to consume more. Investors want to invest more. So you can have a, at the same time there's an investment boom, also a consumption boom. And the particular form that took in the US was people saw their house prices going up. They started borrowing more on their home equity. And people bought a lot of vacations and they could try to buy second homes with this windfall, their wealth seemed to have gone up because their house prices are going up. So this uh, diagram, and these are all borrowed from an economist named Roger Garrison. So I recommend his book if you want to see these diagrams over and over and over. <laughs> so here's the economy in equilibrium, in the initial equilibrium corresponding to the equilibrium amount of savings and investment. Right? So the, here's the amount of investment again. Uh, but the low interest rates make consumers want to consume more, so they want to be here. Investors want to be here. The sort of vector of forces is tugging the economy outward above the production possibility frontier. And it's not an absolute constraint. The economy can overproduce for a while. It can be, as I showed on the trend lines, it can be above the long run trend for a while not forever, right? People, uh, well, it, consumers who are, sorry, workers who are working more hours, right? Over full employment means people are searching for jobs less than usual. They're working longer hours. Construction crews are putting in overtime. People don't want to do that indefinitely. And there's going to be a scarcity of real resources to finish all the investment projects. Uh, 
And when that happens, price of land starts to go up, price of construction materials starts to go up, and some of the housing projects have to be abandoned because they're too expensive to complete now. Uh, investors trying to borrow enough to finish the project will drive interest rates up again if the central bank doesn't stop it. So the economy can go beyond its sustainable level of output for a while, and that's what we saw, but it's got to collapse when these contradictions become clear. So then the economy moves inside the production possibility frontier. Probably not that much. Right? That's not to scale. That would be a super large depression if uh, output sort of fell by half. So it wasn't that big. Uh, but it was inside the frontier. OK, so in that, to make it easier, in that uh, version I showed you the central bank shifting the supply of curves so as to lower the interest rate. But what actually happened in the 2001 to 2006 period, and very much like what happened in the 1920s, setting the stage for the Great Depression, as demand is growing, just for healthy reasons, new investment opportunities, it should push the interest rate up. Oh, sorry, here's the, what it should do. <laughs> it should push the interest rate up when there are more investment opportunities. Right, because loanable funds are scarcer relative to the demand to use them. And if that happens, then fine, the economy remains or moves to a new equilibrium. And it's a sustainable path to have the savings, which there'll be a greater quantity saved at a higher interest rate. So savings and investment are still coordinated with more saving, more investment, less consumption. No contradiction there. But if the central bank says, oh, we don't want interest rates to rise, and so this is the Fed following the dot-com bubble, as the economy began to recover, they said, no, we're worried. We've got to keep the interest rates low. Uh, they shift out the supply of loanable funds. Here's the money supply growing. And that sets up the same kind of contradiction. So whether the interest rate falls when it should have remained the same, that was the first picture I showed you, or here when it is kept the same by the central bank when it should have risen, same contradiction is set up uh, between consumption and investment. They're not coordinated. You move temporarily beyond sustainable output and then there's going to be a collapse. So that's the boom and the bust. And this theme, the boom and the bust, and you should fear the boom and the bust, were the subjects of this econ rap video. Have any of you seen it? So. Go to econstories.tv, uh, and it's, so it's put into kind of a history of thought context because, as I said, in the 1920s, uh, this the same problem arose, and Friedrich Hayek, whose name has been mentioned before, uh, diagnosed it at the time and said, "Look, the economy is overexpanded because interest rates are artificially low. Uh, there's going to be a crash." Whereas John Maynard Keynes and others who had kind of the first vision of the economy I showed you that, no, no, we're just at full employment, everything's fine. Uh, how do they then explain the crash? Well, there's a famous phrase associated with Keynes, explanation of the crash, if you want to call it an explanation. What did he say happened? The entrepreneurs lost their animal spirits. So the, the refrain of this rap video goes, uh, the Hayek character says, blame low interest rates, and Keynes replies, no, it's the animal spirits. Uh, this was uh, produced by a colleague of mine, one who's lectured here, Russ Roberts, and uh, a filmmaker named John Popola. And I like to say I'm a consultant on it. They showed me the script before they filmed it. I said, that's great but you're crazy, nobody will want to watch this. <laughs> and now it's got like three million views. Uh, and they filmed an interview with me explaining what I've just been explaining about how the business, Hayek's business cycle theory works. And that's got like 3,000 views. So I'm not as famous as Hayek and Keynes. But I com did complain to them that, look, Hayek was actually 10 years younger than Keynes when this debate was taking place in the 30s. And they said, OK, and I guess you can't see it here, but they, they gave Keynes a new mustache. 
in response to that criticism, which had more gray hair in it. <laughs> Uh, so they, they did a sequel, a follow-up called Fight of the Century, where they talk about fiscal policy. Uh, uh, I have a book that I, f I failed to plug last time, but I shouldn't fail to plug it now, called The Clash of Economic Ideas. And the debate between Hayek and Keynes is one of the chapters. Uh, and there are other chapters about other debates, like the debate between public goods theory and public choice theory. Uh, and I like to tell people that they can't really understand this video without reading my book, right? And since three million people have watched the video, that means there should be three million sales for my book. That, that would be great. Uh, so Hayek was a, an economist from Austria, from Vienna. Uh, that's where he was trained, and that's where he was working. Uh, up until 1931, he was working for a business cycle research institute in Vienna. Uh, and then Lionel Robbins at the London School of Economics was so impressed by the business cycle work that Hayek was doing that he hired him. Well, first he came to the LSE to give a series of lectures, which was published in 1931 under the title Prices and Production. Right, so that's the theme of the book, as I've been trying to, the same theme I've been trying to pursue is you change relative prices and you change the allocation of productive resources. Uh, then he hires, the LSE hires Hayek, uh, and he teaches in London for the next 20 years. So it's sometimes called the Austrian theory of the business cycle, uh, as distinct from the Keynesian theory of the business cycle. Uh, Hayek's mentor and person who sort of sketched out the theory, which Hayek filled in more details of, was Ludwig von Mises. So Mises and Hayek are the originators of the so-called Austrian theory of the business cycle. But of course, people in other countries also adopted it. Um, so it was kind of forgotten for a long time. Uh, Keynes was considered to have won the debate. All the textbooks became filled with Keynesian economics. And the post-war business cycles, I mean, Hayek's project was to explain the Great Depression and to explain the credit crashes of the 19th century, because those were the business cycles that they had known. But the post-war period, the business cycles didn't quite look the same. There wasn't always a credit cycle that could be identified. And so the theory kind of fell out of favor because it didn't seem to match the data as well. Uh, but the dot-com bubble, since it was clear that the economy was overextended, before it crashed. That kind of piqued people's interest. And then the housing bubble and the crash sort of brought Hayek back into the limelight and explains why this video was filmed, because it fit the theory very well. So it's not a theory that claims to apply to all business cycles. But when there's a credit bubble, it explains how that works. And so it's been picked up now by some mainstream economists who had you know, forgotten about the, this theory because the models they were working with, uh, stochastic dynamic general equilibrium models of the economy, right, that's the sort of vogue, they don't ha even have a credit market in the model because it wasn't considered necessary in order to get a model that would replicate the post-war business cycle data. Right, so if you leave out the Great Depression and you haven't yet gotten to the Great Recession, you can have a model with no credit market and it fits the data pretty well. But when the Great Recession comes, people using those models say, oops, we didn't see that coming. And I, I mean, literally, advocates of that model who haven't given it up when asked to explain the crash of the housing market say, well, things happen. Random things happen. Just a random shock. Because in our model, it's in the error term. Now, we can't explain it otherwise. That's not very satisfactory. So there's been a rediscovery of Mises and Hayek. And one of the architects of the DSGE model, Guillermo Calvo, uh, so there, there are sort of three key equations in the DSGE model, and Calvo is the author of one of them, <laughs> the Calvo price adjustment equation. Uh, he's just quite remarkable, rediscovered this old theory and wrote a paper for the Bank of Japan Monetary and Economic Studies Journal uh, 
uh, I forget what the title of the article was, but the subheading in this one section is the Austrian school of the trade cycle was on the right track. And he didn't just have a vague idea of what the theory was. He actually went back and read Mises and Hayek and saw that there were slight differences between Mises' version and Hayek's version and says we need a combination of both of those to explain the crash. Uh, so Mises emphasized the central bank's role in distorting the interest rate and Hayek emphasized how the banking system and investment responds uh, to the increase in credit. So uh, whether this is going to result in Hayekian insights being built into these high-powered models remains to be seen. But it is generally recognized that there's something missing in a theory that can't explain the biggest events. Right? Can't explain the Great Depression, can't explain the Great Recession. Uh, and there's another lesson from the theory, which is, the as I mentioned earlier, the recession is when the mistakes of the boom get corrected. So you want to allow the adjustment that's necessary to take place. And the way Calvo puts this is, an insight from the theory is that once credit overexpansion hits the real sector, rolling back credit is unlikely to be able to put Humpty Dumpty back together. All right, so once the egg is cracked, uh, the economy is going to have to go through a recession. It's, there's no avoiding it. But you want it to be as quick and as painless as possible. You don't want to extend the recession longer than necessary by impeding the reallocation of resources. So don't try to prop up money losing enterprises by credit guarantees. Uh, don't try to stop labor from being reallocated by giving people more and more time to find a job. All right, so the particular manifestation of the overinvestment in the last cycle was the housing sector. Um, and not just in the US, but also in Europe, because the bank, uh, the European Central Bank was pursuing basically the same policy as the Federal Reserve System. Uh, why did it go into housing? One, because housing is interest sensitive, as I mentioned. But there was another element, which was there were all kinds of federal government policies in the United States to subsidize housing, to encourage housing investment over other investments. Uh, and in particular, the US government had created mortgage uh, companies, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And they're a kind of odd mix of public and private enterprise. They were chartered by the federal government. Uh, so they're called government-sponsored enterprises. But they're not technically government, they weren't technically government-owned enterprises. I say weren't because they both went broke and are now in receivership. So they are now technically owned by the US Treasury. Uh, but they are given the mandate to their business is buying mortgages from the banks that originate them. Or the non-banks, they're mortgage origination companies that are not banks. So they just make the mortgage and then they sell it to somebody else. So if they can get away with writing shoddy mortgages and Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are not carefully checking the quality of the mortgages they're buying, you can see the incentives that sets up. Right? Just originate as many mortgages as you can. And don't worry about whether the borrower is going to pay them back, because you're not holding the mortgage. Somebody else is holding the mortgage. And what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do is they don't hold the mortgages either. They sell mortgage-backed securities, which are bought by pension funds and money market mutual funds. Pension funds around the world, in fact, bought Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac bonds. A lot of them ended up in China. <laughs> So it actually would have been a foreign, rela uh, foreign relations crisis if Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac had just gone into ordinary bankruptcy and not paid back their obligations. <laughs> uh, but the credit quality standards declined substantially during this period. And it, it wasn't that Freddie Mae, uh, sorry, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac wanted to lose money. Uh, but 
they weren't careful enough because they didn't have to be. They could borrow very cheaply, no matter how risky their portfolio, because they had an implicit backing by the U.S. Treasury. Everybody believed, although this wasn't officially written down anywhere, and in fact, uh, the congressman who was the head of the uh, housing committee denied that it was true, they had the backing of the t U.S. taxpayer. If they went broke, the Treasury was going to backstop their debt. And so they were uh, able to borrow money. I mean, the clearest evidence of this, they could borrow money to finance uh, their housing portfolio at very close to the Treasury interest rate. It was, they were considered nearly risk-free. So that's a subsidy to housing, because that pulls credit away from other, by subsidizing the risk, pulls credit away from other uses and puts it into housing. And Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac ended up uh, buying or guaranteeing about two-thirds of all the mortgages in the United States. And since they went broke and became fully owned by the Treasury, it's only gone up. They now buy about 90% of all the mortgages originated. Right? But this separation of originating the mortgage and holding the mortgage has these incentive problems. Uh, not enough care is taken in qualifying the borrowers. Yeah, on top of that, there was a study by the Boston Federal Reserve Bank saying the risks of lending uh, to people with low income, they're not as great as you thought. Do more of that. Uh, the Federal Housing Administration, which guarantees its own mortgages, uh, they have an arm called Ginnie Mae. They lowered their underwriting standards. So instead of requiring 20% down payment, they lowered it to 3%. And so private mortgage originators had to m match that. But if you, right, if the person making, buying the house only has 3% in it, they're pretty easily wiped out. A decline in the house price of 3% wipes them out. Uh, and when that happens, people walk away from their mortgages. They say it's not worth paying the mortgage to acquire ownership of a house that's not worth what I'm paying for it. OK, it's going to ding my credit rating for a while. But how much is that worth? Uh, and finally, studies show that this was a minor factor, but it's worth mentioning. There was a piece of legislation called the Community Reinvestment Act, which requires banks to make mortgage loans in the neighborhoods where they collect deposits. Right, so they're graded on how well they meet the community's needs, and that means making mortgages in that neighborhood. And if a bank has an office in a neighborhood where not many of the residents are creditworthy, they have to make the mortgages anyway. So that contributed somewhat to the number of non-creditworthy mortgages. So you could say Greenspan and Bernanke created a bubble economy. I, I don't know who the artist is here, but... And it's the two of them together, because Greenspan is the head of the Federal Reserve System when the bubble begins. And up until 2001, Greenspan had pursued a pretty steady course. I mean, compared to his predecessors, the economy was very stable. The inflation was, he had kept inflation low. Uh, but then he started listening to Bernanke. Uh, so here they are. <laughs> Bernanke was a member of the Federal Reserve Board uh, while Greenspan was the chairman during this period. Later, he left the board, became Council of Economic Advisors head, and then he went back to the Federal Reserve as chairman. And what was Bernanke telling Greenspan? He was telling him, deflation, deflation is coming. We need to keep our foot on the gas coming out of the dot-com recession. Don't start raising interest rates the way we normally do. Just keep them low in order to avoid deflation. Here's the irony. The only time we've had deflation in the last 50 years was 2009, when Bernanke was chairman of the Federal Reserve System, when the bubble collapsed. So here's a way of comparing what the Fed did to what, in a sense, it normally did. Uh, so an economist named John Taylor trying to provide a simple model for predicting what the, how the Fed will respond to changes 
in the economy came up with a fairly simple uh, forecasting model called the Taylor Rule, where he just looked at two things. It, you could explain it pretty well just using these two variables. One is how far is the economy below the measured potential output, what we saw in the first chart. And secondly, what's the inflation rate? All right, so when inflation rate goes up, the Fed tightens. Inflation goes down, the Fed loosens. If the economy falls further below full employment, the economy, the, the Fed loosens. Mm -hmm. If it's at full employment, the Fed tightens. All right, so this Taylor rule gives you a sort of series of different paths to follow depending on what inflation rate you're aiming at. So this chart shows you the path. If you want a 4% inflation rate, then you pursue lower interest rates. And if you want 0% inflation, you have higher interest rates at any point in time. All right, so this shows the Taylor rule. Well, you can either regard it as a prediction or as a prescription. If you want to maintain the steady path, the great moderation, it was called, that Greenspan had produced, these, this is the path you should follow. So here's the path the Fed actually did follow in the dark line. So it's staying within the Taylor rule bounds, but during the recession, it's more aggressively easing. All right, so the Taylor rule says lower interest rates when there's a recession, but the Fed lowered it even more than that. And then they sort of kept it there while the economy is still, uh, the inflation rate's coming down, so uh, Taylor rule says lower the interest target. But then after 2002, when the Taylor rule said it's time to start gradually raising interest rates, and this kind of prescription is why the Fed only gradually changes interest rates. The Fed kept lowering until it got to 1% and then kept it at 1%, even though there's a big gap now opening between what the Taylor rule is prescribing to stay on a steady path and what the Fed is doing. It's much more aggressively easing. It's keeping interest rates too low for too long. And it's not until 2006 that it gets back inside the path. So this is just a way of indicating that the Fed is keeping interest rates unusually low by its own standards. Uh, so this is calculated by the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. That's where I got this. Right, and this is the period in which the housing bubble is financed and built up because interest rates are too low for the state of the economy. So you might ask, if the Taylor rule says this is the interest rate that gives you 4% inflation, and you're down here, where's the extra inflation? And the answer is the extra inflation is in house prices. The Taylor rule only looks at consumer prices, and the price of houses is not in the CPI bundle. So if you don't have asset prices in the price index bundle you're looking at, you miss the damage that the cheap or the distortion that the cheap money policy is creating. So the Fed is missing this. They're not paying attention to house prices. So they, th they think they're doing OK because inflation is staying moderate. It, well, inflation in goods that are imported from China, <laughs> that's staying moderate. But house prices are rising at enormous rates. Uh, here's another way to, to show that the interest rates are unusually low. This is the real interest rate on the shortest term loans. So the Fed funds rate is the interest rate banks charge each other for overnight loans. And you subtract the current inflation rate from it, you get the real federal funds rate, right, in terms of purchasing power. Uh, so here's the norm, this gray line, that's the, an estimate of the neutral federal funds rate. So what would have kept the economy from becoming distorted? But here's the real Fed funds rate. It actually gets negative. Uh, that's back in the 90s. But here's the period of the bubble. It plummets because right? the Fed is lowering it to 1% while inflation is 2%. That gives you a negative 1% Fed funds rate during this period. And a negative interest rate, a negative real interest rate, is an enormous incentive to speculate in <clears throat> Anything you can buy. <clears throat> Excuse me. If you're holding a treasury bill that's paying one, a treasury bond that's paying 1% while inflation is 2%, what are you earning? You're earning negative 1%. But if you take your money and instead buy a warehouse full of toilet paper, 
and the price of toilet paper rises with everything else at 2%, you're doing much better. At least you're earning a zero real return. So during this period, toilet paper was outperforming treasury paper. Right? But <clears throat> and so are all kinds of real assets, and so are houses. So people who are seeking a positive real return, they don't even have to be you know, seeking outrageous returns, just seeking a positive real return, are going to be bidding up the prices of all kinds of assets. So here's the housing boom. Uh, and there are two lines here. One is the volume of credit borrowed by the non-financial sector. Right, so it's not counting banks borrowing from other banks, or, uh, but it's counting how much is being borrowed by home builders and investors and firms of other kinds. Uh, and here's the housing price index. So as credit goes up, so does the price of houses. And during this period, they're following the same path. You throw more money at something, the price goes up. And then, of course, the correction comes. And nobody's buying, borrowing to buy houses uh, at, in 2006. And in fact, there's a, it's a negative figure, meaning more mortgage repayments are being made than new mortgages take, being taken out. And of course, the price of houses peaks and comes down. Uh, here are two other measures of the housing bu bubble or boom. The ratio of house prices to income, right? So people are buying bigger and bigger houses per dollar of income. Well, that's unusual. Uh, and house price to rent. Right? So rents aren't rising that rapidly, but since the future rents are being discounted so little at low interest rates, the price of the house is rising relative to the rent. So people are buying houses and renting them out, are losing money. Uh, finally, uh, so these charts come from a paper I wrote uh, for a volume called Housing Boom and Bust, uh, published by the Independent Institute. And the editor of the volume is an economist named David Beckworth. He said, you know, we'd like to do, publish an updated version of a piece you wrote about the cause of the crisis. And I said, I don't really have much new to say. And he said, well, here's what I'll do. I'll add some charts to your paper. I said, OK, great. Do you want to be co-author of the paper? He said, no, no, no. But these charts are all generated by Beckworth, so I've never run a regression. <laughs> <laughs> but here's what he's done. Uh, so Taylor rule deviation, meaning that vertical distance we saw between what the Taylor rule prescribed and the interest rate the Fed actually was pursuing. So taking that as a proxy for how far from equilibrium the interest rate was, how distorted the interest rate was. So that's being measured on the horizontal axis. So uh, the higher number means the Fed's rate is farther below where it should have been. Uh, here's a scatter plot of that against the house price to rent ratio or the house price to income ratio, so two different measures of the housing bubble. And there's the positive correlation you expect. He ran some kind of quadratic to make it fit better, which is why it is, looks exponential rather than a straight line. But if you ran a straight line regression, you'd get the same thing. And it explains about half the variation in house prices. But when the Fed was loosest relative to the Taylor rule, house prices were booming the most. Right? So that's the lesson. Uh, now you should see this as a boo you should see the reflection of this in the banking sector. Uh, and here's my effort to do that. Uh, this shows M2, uh, which is the broad measure of the money supply. It's all bank deposits. So that's on the liability side of the bank balance sheet. And as banks make more loans, M2 will also go up. Uh, I mean, I, I could have plotted just uh, the, the amount of uh, residential mortgage loans, and you'd see a bubble in that. But, uh, and then deflated it by the personal consumption expenditure price index. And you see a b big bulge in 
the size of the banking uh, liabilities relative to the long run trend. It does come back to trend, and that means the Fed has stopped feeding the cheap credit bubble, uh, the cheap credit supply, and that's going to bring, that's going to correspond to the Fed starting finally to raise the Fed funds target and market interest rates rising. So the, the Fed is, has uh, set up a situation where interest rates really have to rise and they eventually respond to that because if they try to keep interest rates low while inflation is rising, then they're just going to feed even bigger increases in inflation. Uh, so there's the bulge in uh, banking credit or uh, actually banking liabilities. Okay, so monetary policy is driving this cycle, I'm saying. Uh, I'm not saying it's the only thing. It's not the only source of credit, but if the credit is coming from elsewhere, if the credit is coming from, say, Chinese savers, then there's no reason for a boom-bust cycle because that can be sustained unless, for some reason, Chinese savers stop saving. But those kind of demographic shifts can explain a secular trend, which we have seen in real interest rates, but they don't explain cyclical movements, which is what I'm trying to explain. For that, you need cyclical variation in the supply of credit, and that's what central banks do. They're not trying to make the economy unstable, but that's the result. Uh, so in the long run, monetary policy determines the inflation rate, but in the short run, if it's poorly calibrated, it can amplify business cycles. And this was Milton Friedman's great insight and his battle against the Keynesians. He said, look, you call upon the central bank to dampen business cycles, but look at the track record. In practice, their timing has been bad and their magnitude has been bad, not because they're foolish people, but because they don't have the information they would need to forecast accurately where the economy is going to be when their policy takes hold. So they're amplifying cycles. They have in practice amplified cycles rather than dampened them. And the Fed, in a sense, has a mandate to try to dampen business cycles, so-called dual mandate. It's supposed to worry about employment uh, and output. Uh, it's sometimes called the goal of maximum employment, but nobody takes that literally because that would mean grandma has to leave the nursing home and get a job. No, it means everybody who wants a job has a job. But if you look at the Fed's track record over its history, uh, it hasn't reduced output volatility. If you look at the entire post-war period since World War II and compare it to the period before the founding of the Fed, even though that includes the great moderation and the Fed's best performance, we're leaving out the Great Depression where the Fed did terribly, uh, it still hasn't improved over the pre-Fed status quo, despite having a more diversified economy to work with. So there are fewer shocks to aggregate supply today than there were when the economy was more farming oriented. Uh, so I have a paper with Selgin and Lestraps uh, entitled, Has the Fed Been a Failure? where we work through a lot of other people's evidence uh, showing that the Fed has not actually succeeded despite its best efforts at stabilizing the economy. And so this boom and bust cycle um, is the latest and the worst case of that since the Great Depression. Uh, here's the data in graphic form. So here's the volatility of the economy measured as standard deviation from trend in the pre-Fed period and in the post-war period, and they're the same. In the intermediate parts, if you look at the Fed's entire track record, much more d volatility in real output, bigger business cycles. If you just look at the first part of the Fed's track record from World War I to World War II, of course that includes the Great Depression, so that's going to be terrible. But if you leave that out and say, we don't blame the Fed for the Great Depression, they were, they were new, it was just practice, <laughs> right? Well, when you lose the first game of ping pong, you say, that was just practice. <laughs> Uh, even if you throw that out, they haven't improved. And here's it, the plot year by year of the deviations. The Fed has not made the economy more stable in terms of unemployment. Here we are in the post-war period. Compare that to the pre-Fed period. It's not any better. 
Not that you should expect it to be, since unemployment depends on the labor market, which is not something the Fed really controls. They can disturb the labor market. They can't really improve its performance. So how do we get better performance? How do we get a better policy? How am I doing? OK. We could tell the Fed, don't be so ambitious. To try to pursue a more neutral policy, such as the Taylor Rule. Uh, there was a news story last week that President Trump has uh, interviewed John Taylor uh, for replacing Janet Yellen. But he's interviewed some other people. So who knows who will appoint. But even if he appoints the best person out of the pool of candidates, don't put your trust in central bankers. <laughs> even the best monetary economists, when they become central bankers, get swamped by a different set of incentives. Uh, but I mean, if, we, if somehow Congress said the Federal Reserve must follow the Taylor rule, I think that would be an improvement. It would make the Fed less uh, cycle amplifying. It would moderate their behavior. Now, the Taylor rule is not purely a rule. It's more of a guideline, because there are some assumptions built into it that are arbitrary, like they assume a real interest rate of 2%, which is probably off the mark now, should be lower. Uh, and some other assumptions about the magnitudes of different things can be altered. Um, so it's, as I said, it's more of a guideline than a rule. But I think it would be an improvement. Uh, but the Taylor rule is designed to try to satisfy both the employment or real output objective and the inflation objective. It would be better to have the Fed focus on a single objective. Right? With, with their control over the rate of money growth, all they can ultimately control is not the labor market, but the inflation rate, so, or the other, some other nominal variable. So either nominal income in the economy, the nominal GDP, the total amount of spending in the economy. Those are all different names for the same thing. I think that would actually be better than a price index target. But as was mentioned, uh, uh, yesterday, central banks around the world have become fans of targeting the path of the price level. And it has brought improvement in the inflation rate. Hasn't dampened business cycles, but it has brought improvement in the inflation rate. I think it would be better to target the path of total spending in the economy for reasons we can go into if you're interested. I think a more fundamental reform would be reinstitute, well, or institute a new version of a commodity standard. And that way, we don't have central bankers trying to guess how to turn the knobs, how to adjust the dials to do the right thing. Uh, we can retire the Monetary Policy Committee and just give the central bank the task of maintaining the peg to the commodity or the commodity bundle. Uh, and in fact, we don't even need a central bank once we have a commodity standard. The obligation to redeem currency for, say, gold or silver or a basket of commodities can be privatized like it was in the 19th century where currency was issued by commercial banks. And decentralizing in that way, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You've got lots of different institutions trying to gauge the state of the market and produce the quantity of money that their customers want. But a mistake by any one of them is not such a big deal as when you have one agency controlling the supply of credit. And when it makes a mistake, everybody's affected. Uh, so if I had my druthers, I would recreate the international gold standard, <laughs> but without central banks, with the issue of money completely privatized. Uh, not going to happen in my lifetime, unless there's some kind of hyperinflation crisis, which I don't hope for. But I think it's important to keep the alternative in mind, if nothing else, uh, to use it as a benchmark. The Fed should do at least as well as the system before the Fed did. And if they can't do that, then they're not 
improving the lives of uh, ordinary users of money. So let me take questions in case I said anything controversial. Bob. So let me, let me ask two things. No, number one, I'll just make an assertion. You, you, you can address it. OK. Uh, from, the, from the picture you just pr presented, basically the dot-com boom and the housing the dot-com boom and bust and the housing boom and bust gener generically be similar phenomena. Yeah. And I would like to assert that that's not true. And, and I, 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 I think that you, you have, did not build the picture enough about the implications of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. That you, okay. you, you said that there are government-sponsored institutions, but behind this are taxpayers. Oh, yeah, and their debt is guaranteed by taxpayers. And, and, and so... And, and I think this is a huge thing. You know, you got somebody going and going in and, and borrowing money to buy, a, to buy a house. The mortgage broker could, doesn't even want to see his bank statement. He doesn't care how much money, money that this guy makes or whether he can afford this loan. Because he knows he can immediately turn the loan over, sell it, sell yeah. it to the government entity. And the government entity also doesn't care because they know they're going to issue the debt. And ultimately, if nothing works, you, the taxpayers are going to bail out the whole thing, which is, which is what happened. So that's, no, that's number one. And number two, the question about the bond rating agencies. That, that there was a lot of questions about this, you know. Why were, were, was this debt so in, improperly rated? And I would hypothesize, you know, I'm not an expert in this, this is just my hypothesis, that it's totally, because of this phenomenon, it's totally outside the realm of the ability of these agencies to rate the debt. You know, if they're rating the debt of some commercial entity, or if they're rating the debt of some municipality, they can tell, evaluate the ability to pay back the debt. But there's no way they can, they can put a risk rating on, on this type of phenomenon, where, where you've got a whole cycle that's ultimately backed by taxpayers. And I think that this is what generically made this whole phenomenon with the housing bust unique and makes it generically very different from the dot-com boom bust. Yeah, no, I don't disagree with anything you said. And, of course, it was a much bigger boom and a much bigger bust because of those kind of factors. Uh, so I mentioned Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, and I think they're extremely important. I didn't mention the credit rating agencies, but you're right. It, it helped create a market for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac uh, mortgage-backed securities, these bundles of mortgages that they would put together and resell to institutional investors. That they were AAA rated uh, by the credit rating agencies. And there was a lot of wishful thinking built into that. And there were kind of perverse incentives on the part of the credit rating agencies. Uh, and the problem is that the Sec uh, Securities and Exchange Commission of the US has basically said uh, to investors, like mutual funds, you have to invest in AAA rated bonds and when we say AAA rated, we mean by these three credit rating agencies. So they gave them a kind of shared oligopoly at helping mutual funds meet their legal obligations. And so they became kind of a conspiracy against the U.S. taxpayer, right? Uh, if, they did, if Fitch didn't rate it AAA, you could take it to Standard & Poor's and they would rate it AAA. And it wasn't going to hurt their business if they turned out to be overly optimistically rating things because they knew the other two guys were too and they had a kind of captive market, the three of them together, because of the mandate that firms had to get their investments rated by them. Uh, so that was a big problem. But what you said about the poorly documented loans, that's right. If you can sell it to somebody who's not going to scrutinize the ability of the borrower, borrower to actually pay back because it's been rated, then they're off the hook. They've done their due diligence by looking at the rating and not looking actually into the mortgage package. And uh, the film, The Big Short, if you haven't seen it, is sort of an entertaining look into that system. Uh, and people, the, the few people it follows in the film who actually did 
look into how the sausage was being made said these ratings are outrageous. Uh, it's, there's no way that this is uh, quality debt. And there was an, an innovation, right, that they weren't, the credit rating agencies hadn't seen before, which was the tranching of the mortgage bonds. Right, so if, if people default on their mortgages, that, that first affects people who bought the dregs of the mortgage pool. Uh, but we've got this higher tranche or, or part of the pool that we protect from defaults, unless defaults get to some historically unprecedented level. Well, defaults did get to an un historically unprecedented level because the housing bubble was unprecedentedly large. Um, and so it brought down lots of bonds and lots of investors, and it brought down Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac because they guaranteed lots of these bonds. Yeah, and they, the guaranteed, really they issued these guarantees because they knew they were backed by the but taxpayer. But the it did bring them down. They're still well, there. Well, they're in receivership. Yeah, they're, 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 they're still there. So they're I, still there. The, so I, the, I, the management I, was replaced. <laughs> so I, I just, but you're right, they didn't lose enough. I, I'd just like to say again, because it, I think this is, this is the, one of the largest abuses of government policy in modern times. And so, I think it's, it's something that's enormously important for our students here to, to hear about. Russ Roberts has a very nice monograph called something like Gambling with Other People's Money. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and this is, this is just a huge example of people in government saying, we are going to help you citizens. And the way we're going to help you citizens is by making loans that you're going to guarantee. You know? And, <laughs> and that's, that's, that's exactly what happened just produced a, and these, these guys at Fe, Fannie Mae with, it, with making salaries of a million dollars a year. They're making salaries of a million dollars a year to lend money that taxpayers guarantee. It's insane. And the system continued because not being government employees, being legally private entities, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were free to spend as much as they liked on campaign contributions to members of Congress. And they were the single biggest givers of campaign contributions. Uh, you know, uh, this is a very complex uh, a subject, and I have a great deal of sympathy for students uh, trying to, or anybody, in fact, trying to figure out what exactly happened. I think that uh, you've, you've been given a very uh, comprehensive view of it, um, uh, but there is a, uh, a more simple way to see what happened, which I've been talking to John Taylor about, and that is to compare uh, two jurisdictions that are right side by side, Canada and the United States, and we sometimes refer to Canada as the 13th Federal Reserve District because our economy is so merged with the United States and our monetary policy, therefore, so sensitive to what's happening there, that generally speaking, uh, what happens in the United States is what happens in Canada. But we had a natural experiment during this period where we had a housing boom in both countries. We had a monetary policy which, for except for a very brief period, was the same in both countries. But in Canada, we did not have a housing bust. We did not have a recession. We did not have any of the implications that have been talked about here for the housing uh, sector. And so, as I've said to John Taylor, John, unless you can explain that difference, that difference in a natural experiment that, that unfolded, where you can see that, that there was only a very brief period when the monetary policy of the Bank of Canada was different, and that's when the inflation rates were different because we were targeting inflation. Uh, I think that the part of uh, the lecture you've heard that explains that is not monetary policy, because monetary policy in Canada and the U.S. Were, were more or less the same, except for when they should have been different. When our inflation rate was higher, we had higher uh, interest rates uh, relatively for a very brief period. I think that the real explanation is the, the change, which has been well uh, talked about here, is the change in the standards that were applied in the, app, in the giving of mortgages. We had no bad mortgages in Canada. 
because we didn't change the application of, of, of appropriate uh, fiduciary responsibility by, on the part of the issuers. We had no government saying everybody should have a house. Not mentioned here is the fact that the Congress kept making changes in the down payment regulations. Harry Reid uh, was, a, was a big leader in that and, and on the Democratic side. George Bush declared that everybody should have a home. This was a, this was a kind of a, of a unique American uh, uh, phenomenon which was globalized uh, the, 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 the understanding of the, of the globalization of it, except in, as I say, in Canada, was the fact that there was a, a, a unit, there was a, a global shortage of things in which people could invest. And so all that bad paper was sucked up around the world uh, in, in pension funds by banks uh, who were, were looking for something in which to invest. So I, I don't think that what we, what we witnessed and, I, and I've, sh I've shown John Taylor this, and, and, and it's an ongoing discussion. But if it were a monetary policy thing, the question is, why didn't Canada have the same effect? We have a border that, you know, we, and, our, and by the way, our housing boom was bigger. Our housing prices went up more. Our housing uh, construction went up more as a percentage of GDP and all that kind of thing. So we had a bigger boom, but no bust. So, and I think that we have to look elsewhere other than monetary policy. I don't think, I don't think that Bernanke and, and Greenspan, both of whom I spoke to during that period, and during which, uh, the, as I say, we were monitoring monetary policy in Canada very carefully, there was no uh, impetus for this crash from monetary policy uh, that I can see. And uh, obviously, John. Taylor takes takes a, a different view and would, would agree, I think, with the with the analysis here. But then there is to be explained. It's always, you know, the, bar, the dog that didn't bark, right? You remember the the, the famous uh, famous um, thing by uh, Sherlock Holmes, the dog that doesn't bark. So why didn't we have a, a bust in Canada? And if I were a student looking at this, I would make those comparisons and I would say, well, how come? If this is the explanation. How come Canada didn't have the same result? So I just I, I, I felt compelled to add that because uh, <laughs> there the is this puzzle. In Israel. Huh? Hmm? What you're saying about Canada, the same thing happened in Israel. We also did get in a very big recession before we had an housing boom <laughs> because of the constraints of mortgage. Because the way our bank system is organized in Israel, we never got in a situation that it was possible to get 110% mortgage at a very low price. Right. So I think exactly. that's, uh, in that case, we were very similar to Canada. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you had a you had a question? Well, yeah. I, if you saw it in the what, your last sentence, I believe, was you believe that the Fed there is to be canceling the central banking if you have this option. My question to you is, so if we, for example, tomorrow morning canceling the central banking, mm -hmm. how me as a citizen can be assured that private banks or private companies don't have all the power to steal my money? How can I know there isn't any regulator who to prevent them to do so? Because in the end, in, in the head of these companies, there is a person who wants to get richer. And I'm against fraud. Hmm? I'm against fraud. <laughs> I didn't so say I, you, I, you. I think there should be. I think there should be legal rules and prosecution of people who commit frauds. But I was talking about monetary policy. So you can keep whatever <coughs> bank regulations you want. They don't have to be done by the central bank. In a lot of countries, they're done by a separate agency. So you believe that? So who do you think there need to be regulated about banks, for example? Well, I think most bank regulation has been counterproductive. It's, I mean, we've <laughs> made our banks weaker. Uh, it, it, it's been a sort of change from the 19th century where uh, 
We made the, the banks weak by restricting them. In the 20th century, we've made, at least in the United States, we've made banks weaker by guaranteeing them. <laughs> right? So the, the customers don't exercise any due diligence in choosing among banks. And so the bankers can get away with whatever the regulators let them get away with, because the customers aren't shopping around for a safe bank. That means that the banks are as weak as the regulators will allow them to be. And if bankers are incentivized to take risks, as they have been, uh, by too big to fail policies, right? Because they get to keep the upside, but if they fail, they don't absorb all the downside. That's an incentive to take risks. Then they will find ways to take risks. And they will hire people who are cleverer than the central bank hires to try to, or they'll be one step ahead. Uh, the people who are trying to detect how they're taking new risks. And so uh, that's not the way to do it. I think in a system where banks are not guaranteed against failure, we know this from historical experience, they hold more capital. They have a much bigger cushion against any particular investment loss. Uh, and the public is more diligent, and they have to rely upon certification by third parties who don't have any incentive to rescue the bad banks. So banks were regulated by their clearinghouse associations before uh, national governments got into it. If a bank wanted to deal with other banks, the other banks wanted to know that they were honest and sound. And so they required them to submit their balance sheets and submit to auditors. They were bank auditors before there were uh, before there was legislation requiring that. So there is a certain amount of regulation, uh, even if it's not imposed by governmental authorities. Uh, but yeah, I think there should be rules against fraud, no question about that, and rules against misrepresentation of the products that are being sold to consumers. Um, but I think practice, experience shows that banking systems are actually safer when they're not guaranteed. So, I mean, that we've had perverse bank regulation. That's my conclusion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, would you say that in the current uh, interest, interest environment, the, the, the extremely low interest environment, both in the US and here in Israel, um, would you say that a possible, a possible second or a third, if, if you can, the, the thumb bust is, is upcoming in the, in the few years? Yeah, so that's a good question, and here I'm more sympathetic to Michael's position. Um, when the Fed hit zero rates uh, in 2009, they lowered their target as low as they could. I thought, well, surely this is overdoing it, and they're going to build up a new bubble. But it's been nine, or almost eight years now, uh, and we don't see inflation rising. And not in consumer products. Not in consumer products. So the question is, do we see asset bubbles forming? Indeed. And I didn't see it until recently, uh, but now I'm beginning to worry because, and other people may have other perspectives. They may have seen things I haven't seen. I saw a story the other day about the government of Mongolia <laughs> with its terribly risky sovereign debt being able to place it all over the world because it's paying 2%, <laughs> you know, which is compared to uh, German bonds that are paying zero or as close to zero as you can get. Uh, so investors who are searching for yield, as they say, uh, seem to be underestimating the risks they're taking, uh, much as they did when they bought all those Greek bonds at yields only a tiny bit above the yields on German bonds. Uh, so that's what the would re I mean, I'm not a forecaster, but that's what I would look for. I would look for evidence of asset bubbles building up, assets attaining prices that are not justified by the fundamentals. Uh, that suggests that their you know, future revenues are being discounted at too low a rate. Uh, Stock prices in the U.S. are... Stock prices in the U.S. are setting new records all the time. Um, price of gold hasn't done much, but yes, yeah, stock prices are.
are booming. And usually when the ratio of stock prices to the stock's earnings gets historically high, it's the price that comes back down rather than the earnings that go up. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned earlier two things. Um, the first thing you say that the Fed should do as good before they used to be fed. Yeah. Do the economy. And the second thing you said that we should be careful about uh, what the governor of the central bank, how they act, because they become swamped when they get to their position. Mm -hmm. So I assess that subconsciously, unconsciously, there's a question that comes up. Shouldn't be any research department or operation department that inspect kind of inspectors about the Fed's do what, what the Feds do, or it's the IMF work, IMF job, or it's the World Bank job. Uh, it's interesting question. Some of the best analyses of the global financial crisis have come out of the Bank for International Settlements, in particular. <laughs> Uh, economists named Claudio Borio and William R. White, no relation. Uh, but I heard Borio give a talk and he said, you know, I'm kind of on delicate ground here criticizing central bank policies because the Bank for International Settlements is funded <laughs> by the world's central banks. That's who our client is. We clear settlements between central banks. Uh, so yeah, a watchdog agency couldn't hurt. I mean, what we have now is there are research departments at, the, at all the central banks in the world, but the researchers don't have much incentive to look for what the central bank is doing wrong. They, there is occasional criticism coming out of, but you have to look for it. It's, it's not publicized as much as other findings by the central bank economists. Um, but uh, there's a the systemic problem, which is a very high fraction of all the monetary economists in the world are either on the central bank payroll <laughs> or want to be friends with the central bank because that's a source of consulting appointments and conference invitations and so on. Um, and so there's a kind of status quo bias built in. And you have to be willing. Uh, to sort of give all that up if you want to become an outsider. Although John Taylor's been the, the, probably the best, most effective critic of the Federal Reserve System. And if he gets appointed to head it, that would be remarkable. <laughs> I'm sure the insiders in the Fed are telling the Trump administration, no, 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 this guy's terrible. Uh, somebody else whose name has been put forward as a regular member of the Board of Governors, Marvin Goodfriend, has been a pretty harsh critic of the Fed. He's at Carnegie Mellon University. And I know for a fact that that's, that's been the chatter. People inside the Fed saying, no, 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 don't appoint this guy. He's terrible. And so it, it w would require uh, the administration not to defer to the opinion of the Fed about who should be appointed to the Fed. Um, and I, there's some chance of that, but who knows? Uh, Trump may appoint one of his friends who doesn't really know anything about central banking. That's possible, too. <laughs> this could be the last question. Sorry. OK. Can you maybe say a few words about the uh, crypto like blockchain and algorithms for controlling the monetary system? And OK. Um, so we had a breakout session the other day. Um, but actually, I'm, I'm scheduled at the end of this month to give a talk to something called the Blockchain Economic Forum. So I've been educating myself so I don't say anything foolish in front of the people who actually understand the technology. Uh, but I don't claim to understand the technology, but I understand what Bitcoin is, and it's a potential money. It, it isn't a money yet. I mean, people don't buy coffee with Bitcoin, except in very rare circumstances. Um, it's a fascinating phenomenon. The fact that it has a positive value is surprising because it's not a claim to anything. Uh, but it does give you access to the blockchain, which has other uses even besides making payments. I mean, it is useful for making payments from stranger to stranger. That's the incredible innovation. Right? So somebody in Afghanistan can send money to somebody in Brazil without having to trust any intermediary like Western Union. 
without even having to trust the recipient to keep a record of it because the blockchain is recording it. Every transaction is recorded and kept in the permanent record like a fly trapped in amber. Uh, can that become money? Uh, I'm still skeptical because it's got three big problems. One is the network effect. People want to be paid in the money they can turn around and spend. So people are going to be reluctant to hold much of their uh, wealth in the form of Bitcoin. Uh, uh, secondly, it, the price is very volatile. Because of the way the, the Bitcoin system is set up, the quantity doesn't respond to the price. It's got a vertical supply curve. So when demand changes, it's all in the price. Uh, if it becomes more widely used for transactions, that would help moderate the volatility. But for right now, it's hard to get over that hump. Why would people adopt it if nobody else is accepting it and it's holding it is very risky? Although most of the risk has been on the upside lately, so it is attractive for that reason. But third, uh, this validation technology is enormously consuming of computer time. And so the transactions are actually very slowly validated. There's no, Bitcoin can do about seven transactions per second over the entire system. Visa does thousands of transactions per second. There's no way they can scale up under the current configuration anyway to that level of transactions. So it's never going to be, unless they change it radically, it's never going to be a retail payment system. The most it can hope for is to be an interbank clearing system. But banks are not going to have liabilities in Bitcoin unless the public wants to hold Bitcoin deposits for transactions, and that's subject to the first two problems. Uh, so the blockchain has lots of potential, and I see new uses for this sort of public ledger technology, transparently recording transactions mm -hmm. so that everybody can see them. That's got lots of applications. But payment system, it's kind of clunky as a payment system. So I don't see it uh, coming to be the world's dominant money anytime soon. Okay, thank you.